So I finally started to post a couple of videos of me cruising around in the car. It does get driven a lot, just haven't really been documenting it the way I should probably. Uh, so I'm gonna put together a three part series. Uh, first one's gonna be kind of the front third of the car. Second's gonna be the cockpit electronics, stuff like that. The third will be engine, turbos, intercooler, rear suspension, that kind of stuff. So basically a walk around in the car in three parts, um, kind of walking through some of the technical details and the strategies and why I did some of the things that I did. So this week I'll start with the first one. So for this first video, I'll be just talking about the front end, what's going on in the front, bodywork, kind of front suspension, some stuff going on there. Uh, so just as a reminder, this started out as a stock, bone stock, uh, 2007 Porsche Boxster S. Just had a fresh rebuilt motor. Uh, bought it from a guy out of Houston, actually an astronaut, like a literal, actually been to outer space. Kind of cool. He likes to restore Porsches for fun. Uh, so anyways, obviously sold the motor out, all that good stuff. Um, but starting at the front of this guy, uh, I guess we'll start with the color, the paint. So this is Verde Ithaca. It's a Lamborghini color. It's actually a tri-coat or a three-stage paint job. Um, this is the one part of the car I really can't claim. Uh, yeah, we did it in this garage, uh, except for the final coat. But uh, a friend of mine, Larry Spencer, really made the magic happen with this color. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing. I couldn't have done it without him. Um, but basically, the car is, is sealed with a white primer, and then it's actually painted yellow. So you can kind of tell, because you look straight through, it looks yellow. When you look along it, it looks more green. That's because the third coat, or the third stage of a three coat system, or the second coat rather, is, uh, is a green pearl tint. So you lay down this really bright yellow, looks like a banana, uh, and then you put a pearl, green pearl tint, so it's translucent, and then clear coat on top of that. So that way when you're looking kind of straight on, you're looking through a very thin layer of the green, so it looks more yellow, but as you roll around around the curves or look down the car, it looks more green, so you're looking through a really thicker kind of, uh, you're looking through more thickness of the green. That's why it has so much movement in it, and unfortunately the video doesn't really do it justice, but it has a lot of movement to the color, it looks really cool, and it and it does, has a pearl to it, which you can see in you know, the reflection of these lights. Uh, the, the paint is freaking flawless. It's amazing what Larry did with this thing. Uh, it took him and I four months of body work to get it to this stage, prep, sanding, block, prime sand. <laughs> prime block, prime block, many times over. Um, so the front of this car, it's an aftermarket LED, uh, sorry, aftermarket HID headlight, nothing special, you can buy them off you know, eBay. Um, but what is special is this is a GT3 uh, 991 style front bumper molded into the factory Cayman uh, fenders and headlights. I mean, if I, they do make like 911 conversions for these cars, but I didn't want 911, I wanted the Cayman. So I want it to look like Cayman, but I wanted the aerodynamics and the mean and aggressive look of the GT3. So that's how I got that. This is actually the 991 uh, GT3 front lip, the factory piece, uh, the factory turn signals. That's how good this bumper is. It matches up against all the factory parts, so it looks uh, consistent, but then it blends into the Cayman uh, headlight and fender, so that's a factory fender. Uh, then these are basically cup two knockoff front flares. They're in fiberglass, molded into the car, so it's all one piece, and uh, adds about four inches total to the front of the car. So we've got a 10 and a half inch uh, wheel, wide wheel, running a 265 cup two. Other details in the front, uh, you know, one thing, obviously it's carbon fiber hood. I got the exposed carbon look, love the look of it. Hate the quality of the hood. Uh, and until you get to really high end carbon, well, even high end stuff has waves and things in it, which doesn't bother me too much, but this one just doesn't fit great. You can see the body line here. It's not great, but I mean, it's not terrible. Looks super cool. I like the exposed carbon and it was relatively inexpensive. Actually, I think it was given to me by the guy that bought the car for me. He just had it sitting around. Um, Bumper is fiberglass underneath, not carbon, but it's fully painted. Uh, what else going on here? Uh, so the front radiator situation's got, um, the factory radiators have been replaced. You can't see them, unfortunately, obviously. Even if we zoom on in there, just because the condensers, AC condensers are there, obviously, uh, the car does have AC. All the creature comforts are, are, comforts are there. Uh, but it's got uh, aftermarket, big GT2 RS size uh, radiators on either side, and then, what really makes this car unique is that I have a big radiator up front. You can see it through there. You kind of see the ductwork on the side. And then the exit is through the top. So it's the back side of the radiator. You can see right there in the top. And so it's at this pretty extreme angle. If you look here, you know, the radiator, I'll show a picture of, I'll 
edit into here, but the radiator is like a 40 degree angle. So it's actually like a full size V8 radiator. Basically it goes up into this corner and then goes all the way back underneath the car. Uh, so I've got tons of cooling capacity. Basically I've got a V8 size radiator in, this, in the middle that I built, custom for this car. And then I got the factory size radiator either side and then oversized with, um, I forgot the aftermarket company, but they're big aluminum radiator. Uh, so tons of cooling capacity. You know, the car's designed so I could track it, you know, at a thousand horsepower. And that's the goal is to have the thing reliable at big power. Uh, there's other stuff I'll show you in the back of the car when we get to that video. Um, it's got a billet water pump that's like twice as big as the standard LS3 water pump. It's pretty, pretty trick. Um, last thing I'll show you on the outside, uh, before I get to the front and then the bottom of the car is the brakes. So this is a, a stop tech uh, caliper that paint to match the car um, and is a six pot basically. I forgot the diameter rotor, 13 some change. I think it's pretty big. I mean, I could fit probably another half inch in there. There's about a maybe three finger widths there. Um, good for aggressive street use. Honestly, on street tires, this is plenty of brake. If I was gonna run slicks, I probably wanna go to a even bigger caliper, bigger rotor. Um, but for my use, this is mainly just a street car. There's no point. Now, if I was gonna be tracking the car a lot or racing the car, I'd probably switch it up to like, I think they call it their trophy kit or something like that. It's like $10,000 brake system or something crazy. But if we're really gonna be driving the car hard and slicks, not only is the car stop better, more consistent, but more importantly, you actually save a ton of money on brake pads. I mean, if you're driving the car a lot, you know, good racing pads are 500 plus dollars and the last three times as long with a really badass set of brakes. So this is nice for a aggressively driven street car and a, you know, occasional track day or something. This will be plenty of brakes, especially on the cup twos. They're not super aggressive like a slick would be. So let me, uh, Grab the key here and open the front up. All right, snag the key. So we'll just open the front here. All this is kind of the factory kind of deal. Um, so up here, all the factory plastics all reinstalled. I've got a JL uh, six channel amp, and then I've got another smaller amp attached to the back of this backer plate, mounting plate, another small amp there. And then behind this, is the uh, JL Tweak 88, which basically allows individual control of each speaker. You can see the USB cable down there that you program it with. Basically, I have one channel of the amp per every speaker in the car, sub, uh, three-way in each door, so seven total channels, eight channels of, of amp, but we're using seven. Um, but each, each, um, each channel is individually tuned, so now we can equalize it separately, but I measured the impulse time from the time basically you the note is played by the speaker the time it hits your ear and calibrated that so that the sound is much, the volume is much larger, the sound shades really well. I mean, the car sounds fantastic and I, most of it's due to that tweak. Basically every channel is, is specifically programmed to sound what I think sounds the best. So really bad stereo. Uh, moving on to the go fast stuff. This is the surge tank. Basically it's about a gallon and a half uh, of fuel tank. It's like a mini fuel tank, tall and skinny. I've got three 255 liter per hour high pressure pumps in the bottom. And you can see because it's so tall and skinny, you could run this thing almost fully dry, like a quarter of a gallon, you still get fuel. Uh, so that's one of the benefits, uh, big benefit. Also, I didn't have to touch the factory tank. So the factory tank's basically stock. It's got a feed that runs in, you can't see into the back of this, and then a return. And because it's operating basically at zero, zero fuel pressure, you know, it's just filling this thing, keeping it full, uh, it has tons of flow rate, it won't. Uh, it'll keep up with the pumps, the big pumps in this thing, because they're having to maintain 60 plus PSI. And if you look at the flow rate of a typical pump, any pump, especially fuel pumps, flow rate goes way down with pressure. So uh, believe it or not, the factory pump keeps up pretty well with the big boys. And also you have, you know, obviously the return of fuel rails heading back into this. So it's always full. Um, and then this, this thing's a gallon and a half. So it'll, it'll basically support enough fuel for 12 to 14 seconds of full throttle running, which means it's just never gonna go dry. You know, if you're on the throttle for 30 seconds, you still have the factory pump filling it up. You have all the, uh, you know, the, the the bypass fuel from the fuel rails coming back to the return. So, um, yeah, so we've got three fuel pumps. You can see the connections. That was a little dirty, but fuel pump one, two, three. Uh, the first one comes on with the factory fuel pump. So it's on all the time the engine's running. And the second one comes on based on mass flow rate. Forgot the exact number, but something that makes around, you know, 600 horsepower and then around 900 horsepower. The third pump comes on. So the fuel stays pretty cool because you only have the necessary fuel pumps running whenever it's, uh, the fuel flow is needed. So it's super reliable. I mean, they're stock style Wallboro pumps. So, you know, no, no problems there. Should last literally 100,000 miles. 
So three hard lines running to a Y block into a fuel filter, 10 A in line to the back of the car, 80 in back to, this, to the, the surge tank. Again, keeps it full, plus the main tank constantly filling it. I've got a fuel level indicator for the main tank, and then of course I know I have a gallon and a half extra after that. And I've run this thing pretty low, like basically empty in the main tank and it runs great, keeps going. So helps with reliability, don't wanna starve the motor, run it lean, lets me run it pretty low. Don't have to worry about sloshing in when I'm on a racetrack or acceleration. There's Because the thing is so tall and skinny, the fuel pumps never come uncovered. Plus, I didn't have to jack with the factory tank. I mean, you've got you know, the level sensor, you've got the factory pumps, the basket, all that crap. If, when you start messing with it, I've run into a lot of problems with factory cars where you lose, you know, sometimes the fuel level doesn't work properly or whatever. You have starvation problems. I didn't touch the tank other than putting return uh, to return. Basically, there's a feed and return back in here uh, under this cover. Uh, for... Power steering, I've added a, basically a GT3 uh, power steering pump. This is actually not a Porsche version of it, but it's off of, I don't know, Vauxhall or something from Europe. Same pump though. Uh, so it's still a hydraulic power steering, but instead of using a mechanical pump to generate the pressure, electric pump uh, just makes it easier to do the V8 swap. One less accessory, as I'll show you guys in the last video, I'll go over the accessory drive details, but the accessory drive is pretty complicated because I added a big water pump to it. Instead of being up on the motor, it's actually a remote mounted water pump. Um, and I've gotten all there and air conditioning and all the creature comforts and all that. So this just made that me easier. One less thing to mount. I don't have to run lines front to back of the car and there's a couple hundred bucks for the pump. So it's not too big of a deal. Just made this mount. It's all rubber mounted. So you can't hear it inside the car when the car's running. It's pretty quiet. Uh, so kind of no big deal. Um, under this side of the plastic cover, you can't really see it, but there's a fuse block uh, for the, you know, the, the amplifier and the power steering and the headlights and the turn signal, some other stuff that I added that needed its own power. Uh, I have a fuse block up there for that. And then on this side, I don't know if you can see it, probably not, uh, but you can pull up this piece of plastic right here and there's an on off switch right here for the main power. So I'm working on the car and I might be disconnecting the, one of the main power buses or something. I don't have to unscrew the battery and mess with all that crap. I literally just turn one knob, powers off on the car and just turn it back on. Makes it easy for maintenance and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's it for the top of the car. A lot of this stuff's pretty factory. Um, that's the goal. Uh, make it look factory anyway. Um, good aerodynamics, good front downforce. Oh yeah, and I'll show you more on the bottom of the car, but I've got this splitter as well. Uh, this thing bolts right on. I'll show you the fasteners here in a second, but basically this is the line. So it's like three inches from there to there. It adds a three inch lip to the front of the car. I don't use it on the street. Just one more thing to rip off the car if I hit something, you know, rock or something, but it, it would work at the racetrack. And I have driven it on the street. It does clear and all that good stuff. So let's uh, throw this thing up on the lift and I'll show you the bottom. All right, so she's up in there here. Nothing too crazy, but uh, you can see that the splitter, you can see the mounting holes kind of right there. And you see this back piece that goes down there. They see that bolts with spacers to this, these bolts, and then extends the floor back to close this piece out. Makes a nice kind of flat floor on the front. And I got all the factory plastic to fit on the bottom of the car, so the car's pretty flat on the bottom. Good for aerodynamics. Um, this is like I said, this is a factory GT3 kind of plastic lip. I have a fiberglass reinforcement that bolts down behind it to stiffen it, so it's it's nice and stiff. Uh, what else? It's got the factory uh, brake deflectors on here, air reflectors. These things actually work awesome. In fact, better than most enthusiast design brake ducting, these things actually work even better. So uh, don't rip those off your car. If you're upgrading stuff, find a way to fit them. Made this little bracket here that bolts it on. Added these tow hooks here for loading the car on the trailer. I've got a matching pair on the back. I'll show you in the third video, but makes it super easy. I don't have to run straps to the wheels, risk damaging them. Um, speaking of damage, uh, risk damage the wheels, you know, going through the spokes or finding a place to dress strap on the car I might screw it up. Just click straight through this, can't come off, and I'm done. I can load the car extremely quickly. Um, see how dirty all this is? I do drive the car a lot. Um, got bump steer correction from SPL. I basically attached, took the wheel off, put a mirror on the hub, and then bounced the, the, mirror, the laser off the mirror across the room so I could see toe change as I'm raising, lowering the suspension. And I adjusted it here to get that down to close to zero, which is really freaking close. Car drives so much better with these parts on it. Uh, SPL dirty again, uh, billet uh, control arms with roll center correction for the lowered car. Uh, you'll see in the back, I have billet uprights that I designed. So uh, kind of next level as far as uh, that goes, but this basically corrects the front roll center so that the car in theory has more roll stiffness, 
uh, or closer to what the original roll stiffness was. Uh, you see the back of the green calipers. Uh, it's got braided brake lines, of course. And then Olean's shocks. These are road and track fully adjustable. You can see the adjuster on the bottom here. Um, these are custom valve for this car. Added about yeah, 25 to 50 pounds of front spring rate. I can't remember exactly. And about 75 pounds of rear spring rate, I think it was, something like that. Uh, and then revalve the shocks to match for the extra unsprung weight and the extra uh, spring rate. Uh, factory anti roll bars for now. And I uh, think that's uh, about it for under here. Uh, next video will include more information about electronics and interior and all the gadgetry and then uh, finish it off with the fun part back end. Thanks for watching and make sure you tune in to the next ones. If you have any questions, please leave a comment.